Hola amigos, welcome to the fourth chapter in this VFX tutorial series. Today we'll finish the effect that we've been working on by adding some destruction animations and Niagara particle systems to go with them. Let's get started by checking out the main assets that we will use in this tutorial. Here I have a couple of background destruction animations that I made and which you can download from the links in the description. They are intentionally simplified in the number of polygons and bones, so they can be used for in-game effects as well. The first one has a force traveling in a straight line and disrupting the ground in its wake, while the second is a simple radial blast. They have two material channels, one for the interior and other for the exterior of the pieces, and those can be easily swapped for anything in your library. In my case, I replaced the outside material with this black tile and the inside with a basic stone, both available in the default library. This is what we're going to make today. Since the ground trouble part of the explosion is very fast, we can get away with 2D sprites for the dust. However, we will use a volumetric lighting model for the particles, which will allow them to be shaded a bit more correctly. The ground animations are in FBX format. To import them into the engine, simply drag them from a file explorer to the content browser in Unreal. In the Import dialog, make sure that you select Skeletal Mesh. The other option that might not be set by default is to import the normals and tangents instead of letting the engine calculate them. Once the import completes, you will have a Skeletal Mesh, a Physics Asset, a Skeleton an animation sequence for each one of the files. You will get my default materials as well, but like I said, those can be swapped on each instance to match the rest of the crown in your level. To use them, you can create an animation blueprint and set their logic just like any other skeletal mesh, but for this tutorial and for my sequence, I will simply drag and drop the animations to the viewport to create an instance of each one of them. As usual, I'm focusing this tutorial on the visual effects, but let me know in the comments if you want a full video about animation blueprints. Before anyone asks, yes, we could make some of these effects in runtime using the Chaos Physics system, and I will probably make some separate tutorials about that in the future. But there are two main reasons to use pre-baked animations, which I think will show better with a different example. This is a preview of a different effect that I have been working on, combining also a bunch of particles, a fluid seam, and a pre-baked animation. The first reason is for art direction purposes in general. Maybe you want these effects to not really follow the laws of physics and be more stylized, or you want one specific rock to hit the camera at a precise frame. The chaos physics are not deterministic, and lack of repeatability can be a problem in many situations. The second reason is for performance. A pre-baked animation is way more efficient than using physics in most cases, and only loses once you have an unreasonable number of bones. Another option would be to use vertex animation textures, which compared to skeletal meshes have better CPU usage but worse memory footprint. This is my very basic setup, the same that I'm using in the sequence. The destruction mesh is aligned with the rest of the ground, and both use the same material so we don't have any visible seams. The outside of the pieces uses a vertical projection for the UVs, so it should be easy to adjust the tiling to match any other material that you might be using in your project. I created a new Niagara system for this effect, which is attached to the OBJ root bone. Let's dive into it. It has only two emitters, one for the debris and one for the dust. Starting with the dust sprites, there's nothing we haven't seen before. It is a GPU emitter with fixed bounds, spawning a high number of particles. If you are using this in-game, you might want to link the particle count to a user parameter. In this case, since the effect is only active during the sequence, I'm keeping the spawning enabled all the time. Next. The emitter has a pair of sample skeletal mesh modules, using all the triangles as the source. On the second module, 10% of the velocity of the mesh is applied to each particle so they inherit some of its movement. In the Initialize Particle module, 
the most interesting thing happens on the sprite size. This is set to a random value with a maximum of 25 units and a minimum that depends on the position of the sample triangle by using the set position divided by a factor, in this case 600, in an expression as the curve index. Note that this module is placed after we take the sample and place the particle on the triangle, otherwise the particle position would return the origin of the simulation. I did this specifically for some of the small pieces, which go a lot higher than the rest. This lowers the dust particle size quite drastically after a bit of height and makes it look like some of these pieces are dragging a bunch of the dust when they fly away, creating these spikes on their wake. Back in the editor, there is an add velocity module to give the dust a bit of forward motion and follow the general direction of the effect. But I didn't want this to overpower the chaos from the inherited velocity, so it only has a magnitude of minus 25 in the y-axis. And the next module is critical to make this effect work. I'm using a kill particles in the spawn stage to remove any particles spawn in pieces that are not moving before they are even updated once, by comparing the length of the sample velocity with a threshold value. That is why we don't see any particles in the viewport while the animation is paused. However, even with the particles not being active, if I wasn't using a sequence I would still time the particle spawn count to be synced with the mess animation, as I mentioned earlier. Next, there is a bit of rotation over time on the sprite, reduce gravity and increase drag. Then, the sprite increases slightly in size and scales the alpha to fade out over time. The last few modules are for collision using the depth buffer, a bit of curl noise force to add some extra motion and a sub UV animation module. For this emitter I am using a sprite sheet with multiple animation frames and this module is used to play it over time on each particle. Most of its parameters can be left to default values, but you will have to point the source to the sprite renderer in the emitter and make sure that the lookup index is set to normalized age. We'll take a look at this new material in a moment, but first, since our sheet has 8 frames on both X and Y axis, we need to set those values on the sub-image size property of the sprite renderer. Sprite animation sheets are a great way to add some of the detail of a fluid simulation without the extra cost, and Niagara now has a simple built-in solution to make sprite animations from particle systems. In this case, we will be using some of the textures from the engine folder, but I will make a tutorial on baking Niagara systems if you guys are interested. Starting with the material properties, this one is set to surface, translucent and default lid. However, in order to enable the normal output, you will have to change the lighting model and set to volumetric directional, which will allow the particles to be better shaded in the scene. As the tooltip suggests, it is also a good idea to enable generate spherical particle normals to get a better tangent space, since these sprites are always going to be facing the camera. Let me pause the explanation for a moment to show the difference that lead particles make. I will go back to the scene and create a point light, set it to a nice pink color and bump the intensity. I will also make it dynamic so I can move it around while the effect is playing. Great, I think this looks pretty cool. The intense brightness creates a lot of contrast on those ground pieces, and the effect will be only more pronounced once we add the debris emitter. When combined with the lining effect from the main projectile, the impact points will illuminate the smoke from the inside, adding a lot of volume to the overall effect. Let's remove this light now and go back to the material editor. Note that here, the texture coordinate is set to a tiling of 8 on both U and V, but it's only used on two of the texture samplers. This is because both the color and normal are taken from a regular tiling cloud texture, while the alpha is sampled from a sprite sheet that doesn't need to be tiled. 
All of these textures can be found in the content examples folder and come with the Unreal Engine. The samples from the color and alpha are added together, then clamped between 0 and 1 with a saturate and then multiplied by the particle color before outputting them. In this case, we won't be using the emissive channel. I want these particles to be darker outside of the lightning bolt impact points. For opacity, I'm using the sample from the sprite sheet multiplied by the particle alpha, and for normals, just the sample from the corresponding texture, which use the tiling texture coordinates. And that's it for this material and for the first of the two emitters. The second one, which scatters the debris, is very similar to the dust one, since we're also using the sample position and velocity of the parent mesh. Starting from the top, we have differences in the spawn rate, this one has only 10,000, and in the add velocity. Here we're adding a bigger radial force from the sample triangle, so the particles fly mostly outwards instead of following the parent's trajectory. Then we have the same kill particles module as before, but I added a second one, to kill those that spawned from pieces that were moving too fast. These two modules could be combined together with an OR boolean, or with an expression if you feel offended by the semi-redundant module. And just for extra safety, I also added a kill particles in volume to prevent any debris pieces from spawning outside the main area of the mesh. The box is set to match the size of the destruction and the option Invert Volume is checked on the module to kill those outside the box, instead of the opposite. The last module in the spawn stage is used to set the mesh index property to a random integer to change the object spawn. And in the update stage, I set the gravity back to the default minus 9.8, reduce the drag, and in the collision module, change the type to distance fields and check the control roll on collision option to make the debris pieces rotate after they hit the ground. In the mesh renderer, I just added a cube and an octahedron from the library and gave them the same material as the floor, but you can easily model some better debris pieces by applying noise to a sphere and combine the interior and exterior materials for a different effect. In my case, this debris is going to be quite small and for just a moment on camera, so these shapes should be all the detail we need. As you can see here, we only need a couple of simple emitters to get what it is a quite nice effect. You can scale this up with higher resolution meshes and more emitters, but I wanted to keep this part still usable in a real-time environment and I honestly think that it looks pretty good on the sequence, with all the other motion in it. The second piece of animated geometry has a copy of this system, except that in this case both the dust and the debris have the radial velocity applied, since we want the sprites to have more of a shockwave motion to them, so they are pushed away from the center of the explosion. We want consistency between both pieces of geometry, so other than that change in their initial velocity, this Niagara system is the same as the other. Because the way the emitters are set up, with the killed particle modules, we can check it out by just moving the instance around. As you can see, the dust moves away, but it still has some friction, so it doesn't get too far before dissipating. I also made another change after looking at the effect for a bit, because I realized that I wanted a bit more control over the light emitted by the lightning bolt impacts, and be able to animate the intensity over time, and also keep them alive for a longer time. I could have done that in Niagara, but instead I created this very simple blueprint that I will show next. This blueprint has a single point light with a high intensity, a blue color that matches the rest of the effects, and a very small attenuation radius, only 75 units. In the Begin Play event, it uses a timeline to generate a decreasing and also oscillating float value. Since the value in the timeline goes only between 1 and 0, it is multiplied by 5000 on the update tick and then used as the light intensity, so this light flickers a bit as it fades away. Finally, this blueprint has a lifespan of 3 seconds, 
so the lights are removed from the scene after the animation has finished. And note that these lights are only spawned on the main line in bold impacts, and not the secondary ones. I wanted to keep that contrast between the lit and unlit areas of the smoke, and having too many lights got rid of some of that effect. Here's our main projectile blueprint, with the added spawn function placed before creating the line in bolts. As with the original light sources, I'm using the offset position from the impact point, to make sure that the lights don't get stuck inside the geometry. And with this, we're done with today's video, and this effect for now. Next in this series, we'll start a new effect from scratch. I already have some ideas for things that I want to show, but post in the comments what types of effects you would like to see in the future. Thank you for watching the video, and don't forget to give a like and subscribe if you like the content and want to see more like it. See you next time!